Good day. I'm making this video in what could be the lull before the storm. Uh, by the storm, I mean whatever reaction China makes to the visit, the almost inevitable visit of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives, to Taiwan. By the time this video is published, it is quite likely that Pelosi will be in Taiwan, and it is quite likely that the Chinese response, whatever it is, will have started to um, make itself um, felt. Now, there have been lots and lots of pictures coming from China of a massive build-up by the Chinese military in the coastal areas opposite Taiwan. There's been films of hundreds of armoured vehicles, thousands of troops. There's reports that China's two aircraft carriers, uh, which, are, by the way, are not comparable to the US Navy uh, uh, carriers, but nonetheless, they are what they are, that they're being deployed to the area. And, of course, the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese missile troops are also being deployed as well. And on the US side... We now get more reports that the USS Ronald Reagan, a US supercarrier, and its accompanying task force is now close to the region. And of course, um, we've also get getting reports that um, Pelosi's plane, which nobody knows its exact whereabouts, it's obviously all been kept secret, is expected to land in Taiwan later this evening on Tuesday. Though again, Nobody knows the exact detail or its itinerary, all of which, by the way, begs a number of rather interesting questions. If the Speaker of the House of Representatives has to be smuggled into a country in this strange way, then is it really a good idea to send her there at all? Now, I can't predict events. I've been reading the Chinese media, my overall impression is that the Chinese response is going to be is going to fall short of an actual military confrontation with the United States and with Taiwan itself. So I don't expect a blockade, uh, an invasion, or all of those things. Though this enormous military build-up may suggest otherwise. But I would return to the point which I have made previously, which is regardless of what was origin the original intention behind Nancy Pelosi's visit, whether it was a stunt that she came up with or whether, as I have to say, I strongly suspect it was another move by the amateurs in the Biden administration, people like Blinken and Sullivan to try to move closer to that desired outcome, which is the US recognising Taiwanese independence, something which I have no doubt at all is on their agenda, even if it is not on the agenda of everybody in the US government. Well, regardless of what the intention was, the Chinese, for their part, have now decided that the United States is heading towards recognising Taiwan's independence of Ch from China. And that seems to be the definite trajectory of travel. And of course, the Chinese are now going to make every conceivable military and economic preparation to confront this problem. And this will be the single-minded focus of the Chinese government over the next few weeks and months and perhaps years and it makes it seems to me a Chinese advance a Chinese attack on Taiwan now almost an inevitability now I don't know whether this is fully understood in the United States or whether the United States does understand that Chinese trust the Chinese confidence in the United States has completely broken down and that this key relationship, the relationship between China and the United States, which has been a key to maintaining international stability ever since the 
end of the Cold War, that that has to all intents and purposes broken down. And in fact, I would add that we've now had reports, I discussed them in my previous video, but we've had further reports from the Chinese that the telephone conversation between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden that took place uh, a short time ago, that that was indeed every bit as tense as I've described it with Xi Jinping giving strong warnings to Biden, warnings which Biden himself appears to have been unable to process or understand, or if he does understand them, he seems intent, just as he was over the Ukraine crisis, um, in the run-up to the Ukraine crisis, to simply ignore whatever warnings he's given by the Chinese. Now, I have to say, I find this all really extraordinary. I understand that there are a great many people who feel that Taiwan should be an independent country. I don't personally share that view. I think that in Taiwan's interests, they need to, at some point, establish a relationship with China. But, you know, people are entitled to their view. I understand it. I respect it. What those people who hold to that view do need to understand, however, is that China strongly, passionately feels otherwise. And when I say China, I don't just mean the Chinese government. I don't just mean the Chinese Communist Party. I mean the overwhelming majority of people in China. If you spend any time discussing this matter with Chinese people, including Chinese people in London, you will find that apart from a small number of people who are Taiwanese, they, on this, overwhelmingly support the stance of the Chinese government. I would say that they don't just support it, they expect, they demand, if you will, that the Chinese government take this stance. A Chinese government in Beijing that appeared to compromise on the issue of Taiwan, Taiwanese independence would face enormous problems, an enormous backlash within China itself. If Xi Jinping were to reverse himself and to shrug his shoulders and say Taiwan isn't an important issue, for China anymore and it can secede and there's nothing we can do, he would inevitably face a challenge from within the Chinese Communist Party. And if the Chinese Communist Party reversed its position on this issue, then, which is inconceivable by the way, then it would face a very, very powerful reaction from within Chinese society. And of course, whatever government replaced that of the Chinese Communist Party would, in my opinion, inevitably take an even stronger line, if that is possible, on the Taiwan question than the Chinese Communist Party itself is taking. Anybody who is at all familiar with Chinese history as it evolved between the 1830s, when uh, the Western powers, first and foremost the British, began to encroach upon China, eventually creating a major crisis within China itself, causing the imperial system, the dynasty, the Qing dynasty to collapse uh, and leading to a prolonged period of civil war, famine, economic collapse and national humiliation in China would know and would understand why Chinese feel so strongly about these issues, why they would feel that any cession of Chinese territory, Chinese national territory, which is how they perceive Taiwan to be, would not just be a humiliation of China, it would be a return, if you like, to the dangerous policies that took place in the 19th and early 20th century, when an increasingly feeble Chinese government made concession after concession to the Western powers, ceding territory, ceding authority over its own territory 
to the Western powers until the point eventually came when China's independence, actual independence, was brought into jeopardy and a major economic and political crisis, as I said, um, took place there. So this seems to be something that people in the United States find difficulty understanding and of course it's leading us directly to this crisis. Now all of this is taking place at the same time as we are in a major crisis with Russia over Ukraine and the Russians of course have now said to the Chinese and publicly that they stand full square behind China on the issue of Taiwan. And again, if you follow the Russian sites that have been most intimately involved in reporting about the war in Ukraine, you will find their overwhelming support for China, just as if you go to Chinese media sites and social media, you will find their overwhelming support for Russia. And it is completely unsurprising that the Chinese and the Russians are thinking in this way, because each now has come to realize that from their point of view, they, have, they share the same adversary, which is the United States, and that it therefore makes complete sense for both of them to work together to withstand the United States and the wet pressure that the United States has been bringing upon them. Remember how just a few weeks ago we had the United States, we had the European Union, we had all kinds of officials from these countries calling the Chinese, telephoning the Chinese, telling the Chinese to rein back on their support for Russia how the Chinese should not undermine Western sanctions on Russia. Well, who in Beijing is going to be interested in that kind, in those sort of calls now? I, the mood in Beijing is now such that far from distancing itself from Russia, China is going to want to align itself with Russia as far as possible because the Chinese know that the major problem that they face from a military point of view is not over the struggle for Taiwan. That may be protracted and difficult, but I've no doubt that the Chinese feel that they can succeed in the event that a military clash over Taiwan happens. What they need is firstly protection from US nuclear retaliation and Russia with its immense nuclear arsenal can to a great extent provide that but perhaps more pertinently they need raw materials they need oil gas coal food all of the things raw materials metals all those things which Russia is in a position to supply because, of course, the United States has for some time been talking about imposing blockades on China, uh, closing the Straits of Malacca to Chinese ships, and trying to pl place China under economic siege because of China's dependence on raw materials. And, of course, the Russians are in a position to fill, to fill that gap. So... China and Russia have been pushed further together. This de facto alliance is now on the brink of becoming a real one. And in the meantime, and you know, not just a real one, a public one. And of course, in the meantime, we continue to have this conflict in Ukraine. Now, I have been reading lots of Western commentaries about Ukraine, and we're now back at that stage in a conflict when the West is in denial about Russian advances in Donbass because in terms of distance, kilometres, these advances appear small. They're seen as being of no significance and we hear again that the war is at some kind of standstill or that there's some kind of operational pause 
or going on or something of that kind. Nothing could be further from the truth. Russian artillery uh, barrages on Ukrainian forces have perhaps never been as intense as they are now. Russian military deployments to Ukraine have never been as big as they are now. Ukrainian losses are probably higher at this moment in time than they have ever been. And as for those advances, the point to understand is that the key advances which are happening close to this important focal city of Bakhmut in Donbass and cracking that strong fortified Ukrainian defense line opposite Donetsk city, that those advances, those Russian advances are continuing even if they are incremental because of the extent to which the Ukrainians have fortified their positions here. This is very like what happened in the run-up to the fall of Mariupol and in the run-up to the fall of Severodonetsk, Lysychansk. S small Russian advances, capture, the capture by the Russians of small towns and settlements which perhaps don't look important on the map, on the map. they are like the pebbles that you start to see cl cluttering down before the big landslide comes. Eventually, over the course of the next few days, weeks, who knows, but I suspect certainly before the end of August, you will see this landslide in Donbass happen. And as I discussed in this previous video, there's now this big armoured force piling up north of Izium on the Russian side of the border, which looks like it's there to deal the final punch. And for what it's worth, in my opinion, its purpose is not to capture Kharkov city. I think that can wait. My view is that it's intended to advance to the Nepa River, to push all the way to the Nepa River, in effect, cutting off whatever Ukrainian troops remain in Donbass, supposedly around 100,000 of them, from hope of resupply, bringing the whole of eastern Ukraine under Russian control. And of course, all of this is happening at one and the same time as now we're getting more and more reports of reinforcements by the Russians in southern Ukraine, in Kherson and Zaporozhye regions. And of course, the Ukrainians and their friends in the West are claiming that this is all being done to counter uh, this uh, Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region, this Ukrainian offensive that's always talked about, which, which never happens, and that the Russians have been redeploying forces from, um, <laughs> from uh, Donbass to uh, southern Ukraine. Though there is absolutely no evidence of this, and in fact, to the extent that there have been any redeployments, it is by the Ukrainians from Donbass to southern Ukraine, not by the Russians. All the indications are that these Russian troops that are appearing in southern Ukraine, mainly airborne forces, paratroopers in other words, are being redeployed to Kherson and Zaporozhye to prepare for the next stage of the Russian offensive, which I suspect could either be the, the southern thrust to link up with that armoured force coming from the north, trapping the Ukrainian troops in Donbass, or perhaps alternatively to advance towards Krivoy Rog, um, Z Zelensky's home city, by the way, or perhaps um, Odessa, Odessa and Nikolaev. So we are again in Ukraine. It's not a lull before a storm because the fighting is already happening at very high levels of intensity but of course it is indeed taking place there uh, but it's if you like the overture to the main act which will be as I said this advance as I expect to the Dnieper and all of this coming at the same time as we have an economic crisis in the West 
I've discussed in my previous video how the West is quietly rowing back some of its sanctions against Russia because of the enormous problems caused by the food and fuel shortages. But of course, no one should be in any doubt that if there is some kind of confrontation with China over Taiwan, then whatever steps have been taken to disengage, to unravel these sanctions against Russia, will amount to nothing. They will be minor blips besides the far greater economic crisis that dislocation of the trade with China will cause. I cannot begin to comprehend the failure of Western leadership, the failure, the, the, the poor quality of Western judgment that has led us to this crisis. Now, the British scholar Martin Jakes, who is an interesting and clever man, though perhaps, and I'm going to say this, a little bit too close to the Chinese government for my tastes, he said that the reason that this crisis is happening is because the United States is finding it impossible to adjust to the realities of the rise of China, of Chinese power, and to, if you like, the fact that the United States is no longer going to be the most powerful country in the world, as it has for so long been. Well, I have to say that all of these moves that are being taken in the West, that, that is indeed what the intention is, to try to reverse or slow down these processes, they're only going to make them accelerate. They're only going to make them happen faster. There are so many other things that the United States could and should be doing in this situation. As it is, we now are looking at confront, conflict, war, if you like, on two fronts, an overextended United States, um, an economic crisis, and an alliance between China and Russia, which has been forged and made still stronger. As I said, I just cannot comprehend how our leaderships have led us to this pass. But there we are. Anyway, like all of you, I'm going to wait and see what happens and you will get my update, my more complete update in my next video. So remember, you can find us on Locals, Rumble and um, Telegram and Odyssey. If you want to support us, our work, my work, you can go, you can do so via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't neglect our shop where you can find all sorts of great things. And of course, if you've liked this video, the short video, press the like button and check your subscription to this channel. More from me soon. And I hope that, as I said, um, we'll have more clarity of the current position when, when, we, when I do speak next which as i said will be i think fairly soon and until then have a very good day